Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here talking about uh, making relational cool again. And uh, the subtitle is or JavaScript on acid. And uh, like I said, my name is Tim Greiser, T Greiser on Twitter, GitHub, and IRC. And I'm really excited to be here uh, today talking about SQL. Uh, or is it SQL? I was actually kind of concerned about this as I was putting together these slides because I know it's an issue that uh, sort of divides programmers, like how to pronounce SQL. So of course I, I Googled it and uh, the first result I came across was this English language and usage stack exchange, um, which I thought was sort of fitting given that we're at a programming conference that it's like a stack overflow derivative. Um, and the first thing you'll notice is that I'm not a member of the English language and usage, uh, so if I make any mistakes up here you'll, you'll uh, know why. But the, uh, the answer was that it was in fact first called the Structured English Query Language, and so that acronym was SQL. Um, and then the name was changed to Structured Query Language, abbreviated as, as SQL. So it was supposed to be SQL, and then now it's a matter of preference. And then I guess there's an urban legend saying that the Structured Query Language was actually a SQL to the previous query language, which is like the worst urban legend I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> But I thought this was a good answer. I don't know how true it is, uh, so I gave it an upvote, and now I'm a member. Uh, so that was, I, I learned something new, and uh, now I'm a member, so that was, that was a big day. But I, I think it's really appropriate that we're talking about relational databases at a JavaScript conference, because I think there's a lot of uh, similar features between the two. Um, and so at a language level, maybe not so much. You've got uh, relational, you know, SQL is, is static and strongly typed declarative and, and in some ways procedural, and then JavaScript is like as loosely typed as you can get while still being like a real programming language. Uh, and it's got, you know, this weird hybrid of functional and prototypal object oriented, which uh, lends to some, some interesting debates on how to write the code correctly. Um, but, uh, and, and also it, uh, it shares some of the same operators, but uh, even we know in JavaScript the operators don't do what we want some of the time. Um, <laughs> So, so what do I mean when I say that there's a lot of similarities between, uh, between SQL and, and JavaScript? Well, uh, they, they both sort of share this similar quality that is not uh, often attained by all, all languages, uh, which is what I like to term languages that will probably never die. Um, and as much as people try to kill off JavaScript uh, with, with different uh, other languages that will supersede it, it sort of has this monopoly uh, being that it's the language of the web. It's the language that runs in web browsers. Um, and similarly, uh, SQL has so much momentum, you know, it's been around since the 70s and it has just been around forever and this is a, a slide that we often show when we're talking about JavaScript, just sort of illustrating that it runs everywhere. It's in the browsers, but also your television and your server and your node bots and copters and also on your phones. And I think the same could be sort of said about SQL, is that it powers the largest websites in the world. It's, you know, behind Facebook and, and Wikipedia and uh, also down to SQLite, which is a flat file storage, which is in more places than you'd imagine um, on, on your computers and, and phones. And so when coming to, uh, to Node.js a couple years ago, I was sort of surprised. Like it, it seems like these two would be such a great fit. They're both everywhere, and uh, why, why is there not more support for it? Um, and I think the reason is that Node starts with no, and no is the beginning of NoSQL, and, you know, actually ar around the time that Node came out, it was sort of like, let's rethink the entire way that we're writing um, server-side applications with this evented I.O. model. And there were, at the time, it was sort of, let's rethink the standard relational database because we're hitting web scale and we need to get past that. Um, and so around the time, the, the, the sort of the height of the, the NoSQL um, phase or, or movement, uh, it's still going, of course, but... Uh, I think is, is when Node came out, and that's why there was so much of this. So uh, all the tutorials I felt like for Node were sort of Node and Mongo getting started. They have literally taken the software and web industries by storm. Um, and all of the stacks are like the mean stack. You've got Mongo, Express, Angular, Node, which everyone has probably heard of. And then maybe not so much the LeBron stack, which is my favorite. Uh, the level, level DB, browser fi NPM, it's a slam dunk, says Jen. And, uh, what, like what happened to relational algebra, right? This, this is um, proven and time tested and, and SQL works great for a lot of things. Um, and this Stack Overflow post that I, that I came across sort of summed up what I was thinking coming to Node uh, for, from outside. 
it, is relational, are relational databases a poor fit? Um, and this is sort of long, so let me just pick out a few things. Uh, there's sort of a degree of antipathy toward relational databases is, is uh, observation that you could make of the Node community. Um, and that they're poorly supported compared to non-relational databases. And I sort of agree with this, you know, listening to the, uh, the Node Up podcasts and hearing about all the uses with uh, CouchDB and with Mongo, it was sort of like, well, you know, I guess relational databases aren't cool anymore. Um, so I dug a little further and I found out that there are actually really great libraries out there um, for, for working with SQL in Node. So Node, you know, all the popular open source as well as MS SQL and, and Oracle now came out with an official one. Um, but the, pr the problem, I guess, or, or the difficulty with these libraries is that there's not a common database API uh, for all of them. So Node didn't assume that uh, a relational database was a given. So in other languages and ecosystems, there's sort of a standard for how you're interacting with common uh, patterns of, of a database, like how you connect, how you disconnect, um, and that doesn't exist. So what that lends to is that all of the different clients have a different... Um, way of, of dealing with these things that should be pretty common. And there's also, um, I guess, the, the next thing I noticed was that the higher level abstractions were lacking a little bit. Um, and what I mean by that is that a lot of them were database specific. So there was a great query builder, but it works for Postgres specifically. Um, or there's a, another great one for another language and there's no way to use the same for both uh, different APIs. Or there's a mix of an ORM layer and a query layer. So there's no ability to drop down and use just vanilla SQL if you need to. Um, one that was big for me uh, is the lack of transaction APIs. So there wasn't any mention of transactions uh, in any of the higher level libraries that I had seen at the time. And that's sort of what the, the second uh, subtitle of the talk is the, that I'll get to in a little bit. Um, then there was the jack of all trades where it's sort of like, hey, you can use the same save API to save your... Uh, to Redis or to Mongo or to your relational database or to the file system. And it's like, well, you know, if you have the same API for all these different um, specialized uh, data stores, then you're really not taking advantage of the, uh, the best use cases for each of them. Or there's sort of what I call the, the DIY, like it, it gets you most of the way, but like modularity. So like you have to assemble all these different pieces yourself, like the, the pooling and the query construction and the uh, abstracting the database API. Um, so it, it, the ecosystem, I, I would definitely agree with the, uh, with the Stack Overflow post that there, there is um, sort of a, a, a need there that needs to be filled. And, uh, but I really wanted this to happen. So I really love writing JavaScript and I, I was like, okay, well maybe, maybe we can do something better. And at the time I had been writing a lot of PHP, um, this is back in 2012, in a framework called Laravel, which, which some might have heard of. And it actually makes writing PHP like pretty like tolerable. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but and, and I was also using a lot of backbone. So I was thinking, okay, well maybe I could take some of the ideas for, from both of these. And I sort of translated the query builder uh, from Laravel into uh, this project called Connects.js. And this sort of illustrates what pieces were taken from each. But uh, the eloquent ORM from Laravel and some of the ideas from backbone into, into Bookshelf and then mix in some promises. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about these two libraries that, that I have uh, put together, um, Connects and Bookshelf. So the first is, uh, is Connex, and if you're not familiar with where the name comes from, it's this, uh, it's this toy that was sort of popular like in the 90s, and uh, it's sort of like a cheaper version of Legos. You can assemble all these little, little pieces together and build um, pretty cool looking things. And uh, you know, actually, it's also really great if you're procrastinating making conference slides. Um, I decided to make this little like motorcycle here, and uh, all right, JSConf. <laughs> um, but the, the reason that I think, uh, it, what, what Connects tries to do is standardize the, some of the uh, inconsistencies in SQL. So SQL is a, is a language, an ANSI language specification, but it's not like it is what we're used to with, uh, with like ES5 or ES6 and beyond, where we sort of have this compatibility table and we can see that Babel's in the head of everything else in terms of uh, implementing all the different features. Um, but it feels more like the uh, can I use, uh, where it's sort of, it's more like a language guideline. And so there's features that exist in some dialects and not others. You can, you know, wrap DDL statements in transactions in Postgres, but not in MySQL, but it doesn't fail but it fails sometimes, or di di different inconsistencies that 
Connex tries to sort of paper over. Um, and this is uh, sort of an illustration of the different pieces as they're coming together internally. Uh, have things like connection pooling, so to make sure that you're, you're getting uh, connections and you don't have to continuously reconnect to the database every time that you issue a query. Uh, mixes in some of the grammars from the different dialects. Uh, and then creates a client which is used in the, in the schema and the normal query building as well as transactions which I just sort of break out entirely because I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on those. And, uh, and then on top of that we have some higher level APIs for doing some familiar uh, tr uh, migrations and seeding as you'd see in something like Rails. Um, so how you get started with Connects is to just give it a connection string. If you want to configure the pool you can do that. And it works against a uh, number of different databases, uh, including Oracle, which is pretty cool. Somebody just opened a pull request, and it was like, oh, I don't use Oracle, but that's awesome that uh, you open a pull request. Yay, open source. Um, and it also supports Web SQL, but I don't really recommend that because that, uh, that's deprecated, I guess. Uh, the browsers sort of killed it off. Um, but what it tries to do is make it so that you don't have to concatenate strings to build SQL. So it's sort of SQL as you'd write it. So select all from accounts where uh, activated is one, and then you call then on it, and it has the familiar promise uh, chaining API. So it issues that query and returns the result of the query, and then you can catch the error if that happens in the standard, uh, standard promise. It's, it's actually great that I don't have to argue too much in favor of promises now that they're actually in the spec, but when I was starting out, uh, that was a thing that it was still up for debate whether that was, uh, whether you should use that. Also does joins, and I don't have to read it out too much, but uh, joins with multiple clauses, um, and then subqueries, so anywhere, so here we have a where in clause, um, and anywhere that you might want to use a subquery, the general rule of thumb is that you can pass a function and then use the context of that closure as a new subquery. Um, and then from there, I'm not going to dive into all the uh, features because that's what documentation's for, but you can do raw queries, like if you have a specialized query that you don't want to, uh, that maybe does some things that aren't supported by Connects, you can issue those, aggregates, uh, subquery aliasing, and what it really tries to do is, is tries hard not to uh, let you screw up. Like it tries to catch different errors or, or paper over things uh, for you so you don't, don't make too many mistakes. Um, and so the subtitle of the talk, as I mentioned, is or JavaScript on ACID. So this is um, not the, the ACID test, which some are probably familiar with. Um, I've mentioned this to someone, they're like, oh, you mean like the, the browser suite? And I was like, oh, no, let me look that up, though. So it's good to know that Chrome is passing uh, the ACID 3 test as of today. But what I mean is uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And these are the uh, principal, I'm not going to go into each of them because that could be like a, a separate talk about each of uh, the uh, individual terms, but uh, transactions uh, sort of sum up that and what they do is give you the ability to have a sort of snapshot state of the world as you're working with your database. Um, so what it allows you to do is roll back to a certain point in time and also prevent uh, other connections that might be working against your databases from altering rows as you're working with it within a single atomic unit of, uh, of state. And this is kind of difficult to, to uh, do in Node. Like you have to think about this API in advance because in order for this to work you have to have the same database connection um, passed to every single query that you're working against. Uh, and so it's not like in synchronous uh, languages where you can just sort of say like, okay, start transaction here, and then all of these will run right here, and then end it right here, because you sort of, with, with the uh, evented I.O. model, and um, you, you sort of lose that context as you go with the callback. You, you don't really know what's happening. So the connection explicitly has to be passed to every query. Um, so let's think about a, a situation where we would actually want to use transactions. So here's a simple user flow situation where somebody's registering for a website and you, they uh, register and you give them an ID and then you have to send that to a third party service and then you have to create maybe some other rows for that user and then it's all done, they're all registered. Um, so let's think about like what could go wrong in, in these four steps. So first you might depend on a module which like doesn't follow semantic versioning. Um, and so something breaks and it's like completely out of your control or the third party API that you're working against sort of shuts down and your data gets into a bad state. 
So in order to deal with that then, you know, after step two, if that fails, then you'd have to undo what happened in step one. Or in step three, uh, where you're creating additional rows to, to deal with that new user, maybe one or a few of them failed, and so then you have to make sure the ones that did go through get rolled back, and then you have to uh, unregister the user and then say, hey, something messed up. Um, and that ends up pushing a lot of logic into your application code that you have to deal with all of these potential bad states. Or you just don't deal with it and then you have potentially like, bad data in your application. Because you want this whole uh, register user flow to, to happen as one atomic event. Um, or here's another situation that, that can't be handled by the last one, is that like, your servers just catch on fire halfway through, uh, halfway through registering their user. And actually, I like, created these libraries so I would one day have the ability to use this graphic in a, in a keynote. And uh, no, but uh, so, so what Connects tries to do is you can say Connects transaction, and then you have a um, connection aware uh, connects instance that you can just treat as a normal query builder instance, but it knows what connection it's supposed to be on and the fact that it's inside a transaction. So then you can pass that to other functions which can then utilize it and work with it as if it's just the normal API, but you behind the scenes have a, uh, have a transaction that you're dealing with. Um, and originally the API was that you would just have to pass this explicitly to every single query that you built, so you had like the transaction object, and then you could call commit or roll back at the very end. Um, but that seemed to be kind of error prone that users would sort of forget to pass it to every single query necessary, and then they would have um, sort of queries uh, not working on the same connection, and it caused all sorts of errors. So this is the new API. And like I said, Connects tries to, uh, tries to make it hard to screw up, I guess. Um, and so then this, this is a little boilerplate right here that every time we're calling commit at the very end and roll back, and this is a promise, so we can just return the promise into the transaction, and then we know if the entire promise chain uh, fulfills, the transaction should be committed, and then if it fails, the transaction should be rolled back. So that's pretty simple. Um, nesting transactions is new, and it's the idea that you shouldn't have to worry about whether the uh, client is already inside a transaction. So if you call um, if connects transaction on something that is already a transaction connects, um, it should just create a save point. And so a save point is sort of, sort of like a save point in like a video game, like where you get to a certain point and if something fails beyond that, you don't go back to the very beginning, but you go back to just right here. Um, and so it does this transparently uh, you know, for you and um, you, don't have to, you don't have to worry about, worry about it too much. Um, so Connects likes to take what I call the, the batteries included approach where it does a lot of this stuff for you and it uh, also provides a lot of different interfaces like callbacks and streams and events and two string, you know, the, the different things that, that you'd want to work with in, in, a, uh, in a nice manner. Um, so that, that's pretty much just a high level overview of Connects. And now I'm going to jump into Bookshelf, uh, which is an ORM, which stands for Object Relational Mapper. And in short, what that tries to do is uh, take care of standard SQL queries for you, especially for common app, uh, operations. So when you're building an app, there's a lot of things that are, that are pretty standard, like insert, return, um, fetch, save, dealing with uh, relating different rows of, um, of, of data, and you don't want to have to write all of this by hand. So it sort of uh, abstracts that for you a little bit and takes a little bit of the flexibility away, but gives you um, a nicer, higher level uh, piece to work with. So the different association types, uh, pretty familiar if you've ever worked with an ORM in another language, it's one-to-one, one, one-to-many, many-to-many. Uh, polymorphic, which I, I don't know if these are necessarily a great idea, um, but sometimes they can be useful, I guess. So it supports those. And it builds on top of Connects. So that's where I was talking about having a separation between like a query building layer and an ORM layer, that you should be able to just write raw SQL when you want and then have something higher level that, that works on top of that and also allows you to drop back into it when you need. Um, so th this is sort of what it looks like to, to create a few models with associations. And uh, you can also sort of filter with, so here we have comments, which is a has many to a comment, but we also have moderated comments and we can automatically add in the where moderated is, is true. Um, and it also supports ear loading, which is avoiding the n plus one query problem, which is when you're trying to load data onto a collection of data that if you have 26 items, then you're having 26 extra queries. Um, so it tries to do like one and then another query for the extra related results. 
Um, so an example here is to find an account with all the posts under the account, and then all the comments under those posts, and then all the uh, accounts that actually made the comments on the posts for the account. Uh, so that's what that would look like to, uh, to provide with related and it's dot notation for each of the relations. Pretty, pretty simple, and this is all in the documentation, so I'm gonna sort of jump, jump through this a little bit. Uh, also allows you to constrain eager loads, so uh, you can dynamically constrain relations, um, and then load things after the fact. So if you wanna fetch one row or a collection of rows and then only load onto one, it allows you to, uh, to do that as well. And then, as I was mentioning earlier, that it allows you to, uh, to tap into the query chain to dynamically add things that are maybe a little more SQL specific uh, under the hood uh, as you're building the, uh, the select statement or, or other statements for the, uh, for the model. And so transactions in Bookshelf qu aren't quite where they are in Connects, where you still have to pass the explicit object to each of the async calls. Um, Turns out it's a little harder to, to retrofit that where you have like a transaction aware bookshelf object, but that's, that's where it's uh, going in the future. But transactions are absolutely uh, supported in bookshelf. Um, and just a little bit of uh, where bookshelf sort of came from. I mentioned that it, uh, it came from uh, some of the ideas from backbone models and collections. And ultimately the idea was to see if we could reuse some of the same models on, on the server and client. Uh, and this was back in like 2012, and this was back before I even knew there was like a term for, for doing this, um, which I'm not, I'm not gonna say, because uh, he already covered it last year. But, um, and, and I actually sort of got there. I was able to swap out bookshelf um, models and collections for like the backbone uh, to do MVC and actually use it targeting web SQL, which was kind of cool, I guess. I don't know, I built a to-do list and that's pretty special, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, but really I think like shared models sound great, but it's not really as great in practice because you have to know a lot more, or there, you, there's sort of a limit to what you can do. You have to um, load all the data and y you lose out on a lot because um, you don't need as much of what you would need on the server on the client if you're just displaying it. So it sounds great, not as great in practice, and it's something that I'm sort of moving away from some of the model and uh, collection conventions from, from Backbone based on uh, some of the things I've learned having been out there for a little while. Uh, so you can read more in the docs, I'm not gonna go too much uh, further into it, but I think one thing I'd like to point out is that Connects and Bookshelf are, are not the first to do this. Uh, so I mentioned earlier there was already uh, higher level SQL abstractions in, in JavaScript that I saw and I was like, oh, I'll build these instead. Um, and hopefully it's not the last to do this. So a few other projects, uh, Open Record is a really great project that's using Connects under the hood. Um, and it provides more of an active record like syntax. And SQLize was the big one and is still, still a big one. And uh, it didn't have support for transactions. It had a really, uh, the, the APIs were sort of rough. And since then, it's, it's come a long way. I've been really impressed with a lot of the development going on with SQLize. So if you haven't taken a look at it in a while, uh, definitely take another look. They're doing some really, really cool things, especially around the, uh, the new Postgres um, features, features that are coming out. Uh, a new one that I just saw recently, it was actually by someone who had been frequently uh, commenting on, on Bookshelf and Connects projects, and I guess maybe had some opinions that were different, created this uh, Azul JS, and I was looking through, and it's really impressive. Um, it does transactions, it uh, doesn't have quite the separation between the query building and the ORM layer, but it, it does a lot for you at the, uh, at the ORM layer, so that's another one worth, worth checking out. Uh, SQL Bricks, I guess, is pretty similar to Connects, but with different opinions. Uh, NEDB SQL, Node SQL, which is by uh, Brian Carlson, who does the excellent uh, Node Postgres driver. Even the drivers have come a, a really long way since, since I had initially looked at them in 2012. Um, the Node MySQL driver has just a ton of documentation improvements and a lot of features added, and it's really impressive how far uh, it's come in the, in the last couple of years. Um, there are different projects built on Connects, Connects Query Lab, which allows you to demo this in the browser and have it spit out the SQL. Uh, Bookends sort of does uh, data, nested data loading and querying uh, really well. It's on top of Bookshelf. And uh, then there's Endpoints, which is a JSON API compliant um, library uh, or framework, I guess, that uh, has Connects and Bookshelf under the hood. And then there's uh, larger stack 
implementations like, like Sales, which has their own ORM, but I know they were uh, talking about potentially using Connects as the query builder under the hood. And so they're also targeting you know, all the different uh, SQL drivers. And you know, that's just some of what's out there, but I really don't think this is enough. Um, so we're still sort of like at this stage where Node is a really young ecosystem. And a lot of times you'll hear, don't reinvent the wheel, like it's already been done. But I, I sort of disagree with this. I think that people should absolutely be reinventing the wheel um, with an asterisk, uh, just not on the client side, because like React already did this. Um, no, I'm, I'm kidding there. But like, we, we should have more, more experiments out there because I think the types of conversations we're having since React are really different about, about uh, just the web in general and because and, they questioned a lot of opinions. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, take a look at other libraries, take a look at other languages, which is what, uh, you know, a lot of what JavaScript's about. You know, JavaScript's sort of late to the party of, uh, of being on the server and a lot of the great ideas coming out of, around async and ES7 and ES8 um, are, are looking at the best of what's around in other languages. So I think it's really important, like, th as I mentioned, these were adapted from, from the Laravel query builder and ORM and PHP, and I'd really like to move a lot further toward like SQL alchemy um, model of, uh, of ORM and query builder. So I've been looking a lot at those, but there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, but I, what I really would love to see is just Node become more of a target for traditional CRUD web applications and to sort of prove that Stack Overflow uh, question wrong and more so to just get awareness out there that, uh, that you can do this type of boring traditional website development um, in Node. And I think the more that that becomes a, uh, something that's, that's well known, the more people will be writing JavaScript and then more goes into the ecosystem. So that, that was sort of the, the goal of creating these two, two libraries, just sort of say like, hey, you can do this, and hopefully that there's a lot more that, that comes out of this. Um, so that's, uh, that's everything.